Live from the BBC, The Naked Scientists. This week, the biology of the brain. We're looking into the science of brainwashing. We're looking into what happens to the brain as we grow and mature from a child turning into an adult. And also the science of pain. What is pain? How do we feel pain? How can we block pain? And also... Why can't we tickle ourselves? Those are the questions going through our minds this evening on this week's edition of The Naked Scientist. Hello, I'm Chris Smith, and also help me, uh, here to help me present this week's edition of the show, we have Helen Scales. Hi. And Phil Rosenberg. Phil. Hi. OK, um, also today we're going to be talking about, or Chris is going to be telling us about, a portable boredom detector you can take around with you, find out how everyone else is thinking around you. Helen's going to be talking about how seals are actually helping researchers investigate other lives underneath the Antarctic ice sheet. And I'm going to be talking to you about Saturn's watery, lopsided moon. And don't forget that we're also waiting for your general questions on science, technology and medicine. So give us a call right now on 08459 25 2000. Or if you're on the email, drop us a line at chris at nakedscientist.com. And of course, in kitchen science this week, your chance to experiment alongside the naked scientist and possibly win yourself a prize if you're first through on the phone with the right answer... Chris is in the kitchen with Derek and Herbert Huppert and they're going to be looking at the science of density. You'll need a bath or a sink that you can fill with a little bit of water and some food colouring for this one. So if you've got those to hand, great. If you haven't, go and grab those bits and pieces, include the kitchen sink and get ready to do a bit of experimentation. The phone number if you'd like to join in tonight, 08459 25 2000 or email me chris at nakedscientist.com. The Naked Scientist podcast, brought to you by thenakedscientist.com. Now, first off, ice shelves in Antarctica. These are these enormous thick layers of ice that cover up to half of the coastline of the huge continent of Antarctica, and they're formed over by the accumulation of snow over thousands and thousands of years. Now, until recently, the only way we could find out what was on the underside of these enormous ice shelves was by drilling a hole through them and scooping things back up. Or more recently, we've used remotely operated underwater vehicles. Now, the problem with these mini submarines is that they're very difficult to control underneath the ice shells um, which can be up to hundreds of metres thick um, and to get around this problem of access a team of scientists led by Yoku Wantanabe at the University of Tokyo have taken an ingenious approach to using some wild inhabitants of these freezing waters to do the work for them. Now by attaching digital cameras to the heads of Weddell seals the team obtained, obtained photographs of what the seals saw when they went out foraging underneath the ice shells and what they found was an astonishing ecosystem teeming with life. Now, the pictures weren't quite high enough resolution for us to pick out particular species, but it seems that these dense clusters of animals were thought to be mostly isopods, which are a type of crustacean that look a bit like a woodlouse, and cnidaria, which are a big group of animals that include jellyfish and sea anemones. Now, the sad thing is that these incredible newly discovered animal communities have really got an uncertain future because we already know that global warming is accelerating the melting and the collapse of these amazing Antarctic ice shelves. Most recently, in 2002, the Larsen B ice shelf broke right away. So, yes, those are the wonderful things we can find, but unfortunately may not be around with us for much longer. It's not the first time that researchers have used seals in this way, though, is it, Helen? Because there was a recent report around Christmas time of the uh, completion of a study in which oceanographers were interested in studying tides and currents and sea composition. And because, obviously, you have to go where the ships go to make these measurements, why bother using ships when you could use a seal? And uh, to make it even easier, they had a satellite transponder glued onto the heads of these seals, which every time a seal surfaced, it would send the data up to a satellite. The satellite would then send the data back to the scientists and it meant that wherever the seal went, however deep it went, they got a snapshot of that seal's environment. That's right. With all sorts of ingenious ways of using wildlife to do the work for us. Yeah. It's also environment, more environmentally friendly, isn't it? Because you've got to power a boat along through all these yeah. areas of, uh, of Antarctica, um, creating huge amounts of pollution in the process. Yeah, right. If you've got a seal to do it, it's far more and environmentally it's friendly. And too, I was told by the guy who did this study. It's nice and cheap. Seals are plenty. So. Uh, and the yeah. good thing is that they're not being harmed in the process. No, they're not. That's right. We have to emphasize that yeah phil okay um what i'm going to talk to you about is um i'm looking at saturn's icy moon called enceladus now it's been the focus of attention recently because cassini the cassini orbiter that's in orbit around saturn has actually discovered a geyser on enceladus not now, a bloke a water geyser a water geyser yeah like to get a gelstone park or something like that in america um now this itself is, is pretty impressive because it shows that there's actually liquid water underneath the surface of Enceladus. How did it know it was there, Phil? Was this literally hot water spurting up, or was it done thermally? Well, actually, it was because we actually flew through the plume of this geyser with the Cassini spacecraft. 
So the steam on, was making it into space? Absolutely. This was to have actually been ejected into space and Cassini sort of flew past it, didn't quite know what had happened. We also got results from the magnetometer on Cassini that showed that the water was actually bending the magnetic field of Saturn. So some really quite interesting data coming back from there. Well, why should it be doing that? Well, basically because um, Enceladus's gravity is so low, um, when the geyser actually shoots out from the surface, it just disappears off into space. It, it, gravity can't hold on to it. Uh, because Enceladus is just so small. So two simple questions. One is, what's driving that? Where's the heat coming from? And two, why, if this has been going on, we know that Saturn's four and a half billion years old, so's the Moon probably, why has this planet got any water left? Why hasn't it jetted it all off out in space? That's absolutely true. And actually what we really thought would be there would be a completely solid Moon that would be completely solid ice. We didn't think there'd be any liquid underneath because we thought it'd be too cold. Now, the reason why that we think there is liquid there is because... Enceladus is actually in a res resonance with uh, some of Saturn's other moons. So every time Enceladus goes around Saturn once, for example, another moon might go around half a time, or another moon might go around three times. And this tidal effect caused by the gravity of other moons actually stretches Enceladus and causes this heating just by friction. So the geyser's only operating periodically, which is why the, the moon probably hasn't dried out and lost all its water. Well, it's not that it's operating periodically, but it, it's operating all the time. This is where this heat is coming from. But it might be that it's only started happening recently uh, as Saturn's moon have maybe moved slightly. But it really is quite an interesting thing. Now, one other effect of this geyser is that it's actually um, affected the density of that area of Enceladus. Now, we think that originally it would have been at the equator, um, but because it's reduced the density, it's actually thrown Enceladus' spin off. It's actually affected the spin of Enceladus, and the whole thing has gone unstable and wobbled over, and the, the geyser's actually fallen all the way down to the South Pole. Now, that is actually a pretty weird thing to start happening for, for the orbits of, and the, the spins of these planets to actually start, start being affected. Saturn's a very fertile place for space scientists at the moment, isn't it? Because the, the Cassini-Huygens mission has brought back a huge amount of data. In fact, the rings have been captivating people for, well since the time of Galileo, when they were first described. But there was a paper in this week's edition of Nature in which a number of scientists, including Carl Murray from Queen Mary University in London, have spotted these really interesting propeller structures. They're like an S coming in and out of the ring, and they think they're down to tiny moons that are too small to see that are just forming in the ring structures, and they're disturbing the material of the rings just enough to make themselves seen, but not enough in order to, for you to actually be able to see them and they've got about as big as they can get because if they get any bigger by grabbing material from the rings then Saturn's gravity is so strong it starts to pull the stuff away from them again. Yeah absolutely I mean the tidal forces of gravity when you're getting close are really really strong and it actually that's why the rings are there that's why they haven't all formed one big moon because Saturn's gravity just rips them apart again if it tries to do that. The Naked Scientists, Chris, Phil and Helen, here with you this week, uh, talking about the science of the brain. And this week, uh, this story is no exception, because uh, how about a wearable boredom detector? I hope we haven't bored you yet. Um, perhaps if you were wearing one of these, you'd be able to tell us. But uh, scientists at the MIT Media Lab, that's the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston, US, uh, led by Rana El Kalubi, have come up with a device to help people that are not too good at pinpointing the emotions of other people, uh, and give them a helping hand, really. This system works by clipping a small camera onto the side of your glasses and then watching the facial expressions of people that you're talking to and it can tell you by signaling down to a small handheld computer which compares the expressions people are generating with a library of things that the computer's been trained on it can it can determine whether or not someone's getting bored or agitated and the group for whom they think this might be really useful are people with things like asperger's syndrome or autism because this group of individuals are known to be have or to at least have difficulty in experiencing or understanding or engaging with the uh, sort of mood or the feelings of other people. So they think this could be extremely useful. In, in the training sessions, they got 100 eight-second clips of actors showing various facial expressions, and they trained the computer on that. And now, when they've gone back and tested it against various things, 90% of the time it can accurately predict the mood and, and signal to the person using it uh, when someone's displaying a certain emotion and 64% of the time when it's just looking at general pictures. So if it's actors, 90%, general pictures, 64%. So there's a little bit of work to do, but it's, it's potentially a very uh, powerful tool. So that's very promising. On 96 and 95.7 FM, online and on digital, this is BBC Radio Cambridgeshire. Chris, Phil and Helen. We're taking any questions you want to uh, this week, 08459 25 2000 or email chris at nakedscientist.com. Now, if you'd like to do a bit of experimentation, it's time for kitchen science because Derek is in the kitchen with volunteer Chris and Herbert Huppert and this week they're going to be looking at the science of density. Derek. 
Hello once again, welcome to the Naked Scientist Laboratory where we've got some great science lined up and an experiment which you can do at home, it's really very easy and I think the result may surprise you as well so just listen up to find out what we're going to do and, uh, and hopefully you'll be able to try it at home and then tell us what the result is as well. Anyway, with us to explain what's going on and how to do the experiment in the first place is um, Herbert Huppert, welcome. Welcome to you uh, also to uh, our laboratory. What we're going to do is a very basic experiment, but one that occurs in many natural and industrial situations where fluid of one density flows into fluid of a different density. Okay, so we're going to be doing some mixing of fluids here, but some rather surprising results are coming. And also with us is a helper who's going to be doing this experiment for us. So uh, could you please give us your name and age? I'm Chris and I'm 13. Excellent. Thank you very much for coming along. And uh, what with the science we're doing today, my duty is to ask you, what do you like about science? I like chemistry and doing experiments and seeing what happens. Okay, and we will indeed be doing some experiments and seeing exactly what happens. In fact, you will be doing them. Okay, at home, if you want to do this experiment, then these are the things you need. Firstly, you need to go to your bathtub. That's the thing you should do this in. I mean, you can also do this in your kitchen sink or a basin if you want, but the best effect will definitely be seen in the bath. Okay, now what you want to do is run the bath and get maybe 6 inches, 12 inches deep of water in there. That'll be fine. It doesn't have to be hot water. Cold water is fine. And then you need a separate container. You need a jug, let's say two litre jug if possible, and you need to put some salt water in there. So dissolve some salt in that water. And it's got to be quite a bit of salt, let's say in two litres, half a dozen tablespoons of salt, and really get that dissolved. And then finally, add to that salt water some food dye so that it looks a completely different colour. And make sure you put a fair amount of food dye in so it's really quite deeply coloured. And then with all that stuff, you've got to do what Herbert is about to instruct you. So Herbert, what do we do with all that? What we're going to do is stand at the end of the bath that's away from the uh, taps and we're going to pour the uh, salty dyed water in uh, the uh, two litre container down the side of the bath quite rapidly and see what happens. And Chris is going to do this uh, here. We don't quite have a uh, bath. Uh, that wouldn't be appropriate in a departmental laboratory. But what we do have is a nice uh, container full of water. And Chris has the uh, container with salty water and food dye and he's just waiting to go. So, yes, it was a little bit difficult for us to get our bathtub into the Naked Scientist Laboratory, as you've heard, but we do have a similar thing. It's a big tub. It's transparent, uh, which is lucky for us because we can see the effect. But believe me, this effect is very easy to see in a bathtub or even in your kitchen sink. So, really, that's it. All you've got to do is get that water in there and then pour in the salty dyed water to it. So, Chris, then, you're already poised with the jug, but we're going to wait until later on in the show to see what happens. What do you think is going to happen? Um, I think the food colouring will sink to the bottom. OK, well, there we go. We're ready here then to pour that um, fluid into the load of water in the tub that we've got. We're not going to do it yet, though. We want you to do it at home, and we want you, what's more, to tell us what happens and to phone in and possibly win a prize if you can give us the right result. So the number you need is 08459 25 2000, and you can also email at chris at thenakedscientist.com. And uh, please do tell us what's happened in your bathtub in your home. That would be wonderful to hear. Otherwise, uh, please wait until the end of the show when we'll be doing this for real in this lab and Herbert will be giving us an explanation too. So until then, it's back to the studio. Thanks very much, Derek. Do note, uh, if you do have a porous bath, then it could get a little bit of funny colouring in it after you're putting the food colouring in. So you might want to do that in your kitchen sink if you don't want the danger of having a green bath or something. But what's going to happen? Can you predict it? If you want to go and do the experiment very, very quickly and give us a ring, 08459 25 2000 is the phone number. If you reckon you've got the solution to kitchen size, you could win yourself a fantastic prize courtesy of the Naked Scientists. Right, email time. Helen, got an email here for you from Bill Martin, who's actually in Hawaii. And he says, any relation to Prunella from 40 Towers fame? I've been looking at your picture on the internet. Prunella, yes, Scales is quite a rare name, actually. I'm married into that name, so I have to say my, my husband doesn't seem to have any connection to Prunella. No, thank you. Um, yeah, I've got an email here from Andrew. He is in Murray in Nebraska, US. And he says, I'm a 17-year-old high school student and I must say I absolutely love your show. I download it via your podcast. I found your recent experiment making biodiesel particularly interesting for I have been experimenting with biodiesel myself. 
Keep up the great show. Yours sincerely, Andrew. Thank you very much, Andrew. That's great. Uh, what um, have you Ben's got there? In, um, oh. Ben's in Lancashire, in uh, Ormskirk, and he says, uh, Hi, Dr Chris. Uh, just wanted to give you my opinion on the, on the show. I think it's fantastic. I have all the podcasts on my MP3 player. Thank you. So never a dull moment. Thanks for your hard work. And uh, he says, You don't need to pop a check in the post. Just keep up the good work. So that's very kind of you. Phil. OK, I'm afraid I've got an apology to make now. Uh, last week we were talking about uh, the sun's motion through the galaxy. Uh, and I mentioned that the sun went round the galaxy once every 11 years. Actually... 11 years? 11 million 11 years? 11 million years, sorry. Wasn't quite I'm getting even further and further away from the right <laughs> answer as, it's, as we speak. 11 million years. Actually, it seems I was incorrect. Uh, my apologies for that. The sun actually goes round the galaxy every 250 million years. But it does actually bob up and down as it does so. And it does that every 11 million years. So I've confused the two numbers. My apologies. I would, however, like to thank Sergio de Rejules from Mexico City for pointing out my mistake. And uh, thank you for him. He's a clothes scientist and a science writer living in Mexico City. So thank you very much, uh, Sergio. If you would like to join in tonight's programme, remember we're going to be talking very shortly about brain science, how the brain develops, brain washing and the science of pain and tickling. 08459 25 2000 or email chris at nakedscientist.com if you'd like to join in. The Naked Scientists. Supported by the Wellcome Trust. Who's heard of E equals MC squared? You've heard of that, haven't you guys? Oh, sure, yeah. Arguably Absolutely. the most important equation in the whole of science, I would think. Most people have heard of it. It's the one scientific equation people probably have heard about, isn't I it? I should say so, yeah. yeah. But how do we know Einstein was actually right? Because he was a theoretician. He didn't do any experiments. He just doodled with a pencil on a bit of paper. And he came up with all these amazing theories. Was Einstein right or was he wrong? Well, for years people have been assuming that he was right, but now they've actually gone and tested it. Simon Rainville from the University of Laval in Canada, along with his colleagues at MIT, have actually done the experiments to prove that E really does equal MC squared. And they've made some of the world's most accurate measurements yet in doing so. One of the most famous equations of all of science is E equal MC squared. We've all heard of it. And this formula was derived by Einstein about 100 years ago. And this formula says that mass and energy are equivalent. Well, what we've done is we directly tested this relationship. We independently measured M and E. And the C, which is in there, is the speed of light. And that's a constant in our system of units, so we don't have to measure it. So now we compare these two measurements of E and M, and we actually found that Yes, the result is that Einstein is correct. So in his, in his grave, he's breathing a sigh of relief that he was exactly. right. Yeah. But getting down to the nuts and bolts of it, how did you actually do this? What was the experimental protocol you followed? The idea is that the nuclei of atoms are made of protons and, and neutrons. And these are the building blocks, if you want, of, of nuclei. And if you shoot neutrons at atoms, sometimes the nucleus will absorb one of these neutrons and become a little bigger. And when that happens, there's some energy, some energy that binds the neutron to its new nucleus so that it holds all together. Now, because of this relationship that mass is the same as energy, we know that this energy has to come from somewhere. Energy is conserved in physics, and so it comes from the mass. In other words, the mass of the big nucleus is slightly smaller, a little bit, but a little bit smaller than the mass of the original nucleus plus the neutron when we conserve them separately. How did you actually make those measurements? Because the kind of tolerance in your experiment shows to the extent of 0.00004%, a tiny number, that E equals mc squared is correct. But how did you actually do it? For that, we had to measure the energy to that level of precision. And that was done by measuring the wavelength of the little gamma rays. When the nucleus relaxes from its excited state, when it absorbs the neutron, it, this energy is emitted under the form of gamma rays. And the NIST team has measured the wavelength of these gamma rays with a very, very precise spectrometer, and that gives you E. And independently, our team at MIT measured the small difference in mass. And the way we did that is by isolating a single atom or molecule of the two species, the two nuclei we were interested in. And we put them in the heart of our apparatus, which is a big magnet. And believe it or not, this apparatus allowed us to hold on to these little atoms, these single molecules, for weeks, and then measure their motion in the trap very, very precisely, which is proportional to their mass. And in fact, the measurements that we're presenting in this paper are the world's most precise mass measurements. And that's equivalent to, say, measure the distance between Boston and Los Angeles with an error less than the width of a human hair. 
Pretty accurate indeed. That was Laval University's Simon Rainville confirming experimentally that Einstein was right, and he really does equal mc squared. Fancy listening to the naked scientists in your bed, <laughs> on your way to work, or even at work? Why not subscribe to our podcast? For more information, visit nakedscientist.com forward slash podcast. Chris, Phil and Helen, we're here with you for about another 40 minutes. If you've got any science questions, and remember, very shortly, we're going to be talking about the science of the brain, 08459 25 2000, or email chris at nakedscientist.com. Right, you guys, uh, Lisa O'Donoghue has written in, and she wants to know, why does a round pizza come in a square box? It's got to be something about stacking them more easily, hasn't it? And just... They don't roll around in the van or something. We haven't got a rocket scientist, but we have got a space scientist. Come on, Phil. I Open University's Phil Rosenberg says... You see, I think it's somewhere to put the little tub of cheese sauce to dip your crust in afterwards. I think you need those corners to store that sort of stuff in. We are now going to go over to this week's science update where we'll be finding out whether antidepressant drugs really stop you feeling blue. And is it a bird? Is it a plane? We look to the sky for a plane that flaps its wings. For the Naked Scientists, this week we'll be learning about a tiny plane that flaps its wings. But first, the use of antidepressant drugs has skyrocketed in the past two decades. But scientists are examining whether those drugs are really curing depression or simply masking it. And according to a new study in mice, the roots of depression may lie in the parts of the brain that antidepressants can't get to. It was led by psychiatrist Eric Nessler of the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. His team found that when small mice were repeatedly bullied by larger mice, they lost interest in food, sex, and socializing like depressed people. Their brains also shut down production of a key protein in the hippocampus, a part of the brain involved in human depression. Antidepressants temporarily counteracted the problem, but didn't fix the underlying cause. This could well be one mechanism of why people on antidepressants for either depression or post-traumatic stress disorder or social anxiety-related syndromes have to remain on their medication, uh, oftentimes for years and, and sometimes for a lifetime. These findings could point the way toward a more permanent cure. Bugs and birds flap their wings. Airplanes don't. But now there's an exception to this simple rule of thumb. And it's called the dull fly. It's a foot-long plane inspired by the dragonfly and developed by engineering students at Delft University in the Netherlands. Team leader Dan Van Ginniken says the flapping wings allow the plane to fly fast or slow and even to stop and hover. And thanks to a miniature camera that interacts with computers on the ground, the dull fly can be programmed to recognize almost anything, like safety hazards at a construction site. Or you could say, for, uh, for example, um, give us a signal if you see anything red or if you see a, a crack in this, in this pipe um, then it just flies around and as soon as it sees something that is predefined it will give a signal to the, to the base station and say well um, I found it. Of course it could also be a powerful surveillance tool in foreign combat zones or domestic terrorist targets. Well that's all for this week's science update. Next week we'll hear from a scientist who is studying the link between pain and obesity. Until then I'm Chelsea Wald and I'm Bob Hershon for AAAS, the Science Society. Back to you, Naked Scientists. That was this week's science update. And thanks very much to Chelsea Wald and Bob Hershon from the AAAS in the, in the States. And remember, you can find out more information on these and other stories from their website at www.scienceupdate.com. Chris, Helen and Phil, we're here with you for about another half an hour. In a minute, we're going to be talking about the science of the brain. If you have any questions on that, get calling 08459 25 2000 or you can email me chris at nakedscientist.com. I have here, guys, an email from Kane who says, Can you please explain to me what are the islets of Langerhans? Um, why are these areas more richly supplied with blood vessels? Well, put simply, Kane, those are the cells in the pancreas, the organ in your abdomen that makes insulin. The islets of Langerhans contain these, uh, they're called the beta uh, islets, and they contain cells which are sensitive to how much sugar or glucose is washing around in the bloodstream. And they tailor how much insulin they make, which is a protein, comes out of those cells, and they make more of it the higher the glucose levels are. And the insulin then goes around the bloodstream 
and it tells the cells in the rest of the body to turn on a special transporter which draws glucose inside the cell, rather like a vacuum cleaner, and then to turn the glucose once it's into the cell into other things, and that includes turning it into fats, and it also inter uh, includes turning it into a bigger molecule, which is lots of glucose stuck together, and that's called glycogen. If you've got a question for us, 08459 25 2000 or email chris at nakedscientist.com. Sorting out the sparks from the quarks, the Naked Scientists. Don't forget, kitchen science is going on at the moment, and if you're in the process of doing the experiment, you've got about 10, 15 minutes left to finish it off and give us a, a clue as to what you think the findings are. Uh, just ring in, 08459 25 2000, and, and the stories about the brain and brainwashing are coming up. Irene Tracy and Kathleen Taylor are here from Oxford University, sitting in the studio, ready to talk about their subject. Now, people often seem to be very undecided when it comes to the issue of whether size is important, but in the case of the developing human brain, it looks like brighter children with higher IQ are that way inclined because their brains are better at organising themselves. Philip Shaw is from the US National Institute of Mental Health in Washington, D.C., and he's brain scanned large numbers of children over the course of their development and then measured their IQs at the same time. Now, what's really intriguing is that the most intelligent children often started with the least grey matter, but they also showed the greatest rate of structural changes in different parts of their brains. Basically, in this study, we asked, do children's brains develop differently according to how clever they are? I think the key finding was that the smartest youth differed in how fast the thinking part of their brain changes as they grow up. So in the cleverer children, the cortex, or sort of like the outer crust of the brain, thickens more rapidly and for a longer period of time and then thins faster as well. So I think the key message was that brainy children aren't cleverer because they have more grey matter or more brain at any one age. Instead, it's that intelligence is related to the way in which the cortex, the crust of the brain, matures. So children who have sort of very flexible and agile minds also seem to have a very flexible and agile cortex. You did this using brain scans, didn't you? Yeah, we worked with people from the Montreal Neurological Institute and we imaged 300 healthy children from about the age of 6 to the age of 20, imaging the majority of them um, more than once. Um, so children were scanned roughly two or three times at about two yearly intervals. And everyone also did an IQ test, which is sort of like a standard test, which measures verbal and nonverbal knowledge and reasoning. And we then split everyone into three groups on the basis of their IQ scores and then compared these three groups and saw how their cortex developed as they grew up. Were there any regional differences in different parts of the brain in different individuals at different times? Yeah, we find that the um, different patterns of growth were most marked in the prefrontal or the front bits of the cortex. And that's the part of brain which we think is the um, seat of reasoning, planning and other very complex thought functions. And what we wonder is if the later peak thickness, which we find in the prefrontal cortex in children who are the most intelligent, whether this might reflect an extended period for the development of brain circuits, which support very complex thinking. What are the big unanswered questions here now that this has opened up? I think uh, one question is, what's the role played by genetic factors? like the parts of the brain which differed most according to intelligence overlap to some degree with brain regions which are thought to be under tightest genetic control. However, I think what exactly is inherited is unclear. And some researchers suggest that it's the way that a child interacts with the environment that's inherited. So a clever child might have genes which incline him or her to evoke a very stimulating environment. And so like the rich and varied experience the child has may then mould and sculpt the brain particularly efficiently. So it would be quite interesting, actually, to follow these, these on and then subject their own children to the same analysis and see if they develop the same way. Yeah, no, no, it would be. And I think other possibilities would be doors environmental enrichment through intensive education or working with families. Does this have an impact on how the cortex develops? Philip Shaw from the US National Institute of Mental Health with the finding that when it comes to brains at least, less can mean more. Stripping down science. Okay, let's do it. The Naked Scientists.
had a call from Linda in Suffolk. She's very water conscious and she says she loves the show but she's concerned that our kitchen science experiment could be using a bit too much, uh, especially if thousands of people start filling up baths worldwide. So try and confine it to a kitchen sink if you can. Thanks very much for pointing that out, Linda. That's a very good point. Now, Wynne in Northampton says, uh, wondering how badly meningitis can affect the brain. She's had meningitis when she was younger and thinks it might have affected her ability to remember things. Um, now, there are a couple of issues with this. Meningitis comes in two flavours, or two forms if you like. There's a viral flavour and a bacterial flavour. And by far and away the most dangerous form of meningitis is the bacterial form. Because in this instance you have bacteria physically growing and multiplying in the fluid that surrounds the brain. And when they do that they secrete lots of factors that promote intense inflammation and can also damage the underlying brain. And one of the things that they do do is to cause inflammation around the nerves that run through that space. And these can include the auditory nerve that supplies your ears and connect the ears to the brain. And so if you have a lot of inflammation around those nerve roots, it can unfortunately pinch them off and cause permanent deafness. There are other problems, of course, if people aren't treated in time with meningitis, it's very serious and can actually result in people dying. Fortunately, we now have vaccines and things that have been introduced, and this has brought the mortality right down. In the UK, for instance, in young children, uh, there was a type of meningitis led, uh, caused by um, meningitis strain C, Neisseria meningitidis strain C, and that was introduced uh, as a vaccine about five years ago, and since then there's been a dramatic reduction in the number of cases. But amongst adults, the most common form of meningitis there is a type of meningitis called Neisseria meningitidis strain B, and this still remains a major problem. There's no consistent vaccine for this, and so you should be on the lookout for any signs or symptoms of meningitis. These include... Uh, a non-specific feeling grotty and knocked off for a few days first and then you start to get a headache then you can feel quite sick you can become scared of the light and your neck can become very very stiff and then people start to develop things like a rash and if you have a rash which is not blanching in other words if you press on the rash with a wine glass or something and look through the glass the rash doesn't go away when you press on it if you have those signs and symptoms you ought to maybe get checked out by a doctor now, the other flavour of meningitis I mentioned was viral meningitis, and this isn't necessarily so bad. This is when a virus attacks the membranes that surround the brain, and it causes many of the same symptoms, but usually, thankfully, these cases are what's called self-limiting. They just go away and they get better of their own accord. Sometimes if it's caused by the herpes virus, the same virus that can cause cold sores, then you might need to go into hospital for a little while and have a drug called acyclovir, which knocks it on the head. But thankfully, most of the cases don't actually have long-term sequelae, certainly not like the bacterial form. Anyway, we are talking about the science of the brain this evening and from Oxford University, Irene Tracy uh, is here to help us understand a bit about pain. Good evening, Irene. Good evening, Chris. Thank you for coming along. Now, now tell us, first of all, why do we have to have pain? What's, what role does it serve? Well, it's a very important uh, role because pain obviously is uh, something that alerts you to the fact that you're going to damage your tissue. So um, it's a sort of uh, self-preserving phenomenon and therefore a very important one. So the body has a pretty complicated set of systems geared up for alerting you that something is painful and that you better do something about it. Let's start outside and work our way in then. Mm -hmm. What sorts of things do we interpret as painful? I don't just mean obviously pinches and punches. What's actually going on inside the body to, to alert nerve fibres there's something painful happening? Yeah, so we do have a set of nerve fibres that specifically detect uh, pain or tissue damaging uh, type of signals and we generally categorise pain stimuli into three broad categories. One would be a thermal type of stimulus, so noxious or unpleasant heat. One would be a mechanical, so that would be a pinprick, we've all experienced that, or, or a knife wound, or a mechanical, a crushing pressure type pain. And the other type that's less common, but occasionally one might come across it, is uh, what we call chemical pain, and that would be, say, something like an acidic or if you've ever chopped chilli peppers at home and then uh, rubbed your eye, you will realise that really, really hurts afterwards. So that would be an example of a chemical type of pain. And we have in our, what we call peripheral nervous system underneath the skin we've got these specialized fibers and receptors that pick up those three broad categories of pain inducing stimuli and uh, basically what they do is is start the whole process which we call nociception and that is detecting those stimuli they'll send the signals up to the brain and the brain will then unravel all that and tell you that hurts you better do something about it how does the body discriminate between say a tickle or a rub a bit of air, air rough, rustling your hair for example and a painful stimulus? Well, in terms of them being sensory stimuli, they're all sensory stimuli, so we're aware where they came from. So we'll say, you know, the tickle or the rub was on our hand or on our leg. Whether it's painful and therefore you need to withdraw your hand or you need to rub it because it's very painful, that's where the brain kicks in and where obviously the 
type of stimulus that's causing it is very important in the first instance. And we're just really understanding the difference between those two, the sensory non-painful phenomenon and the painful phenomenon, because we've had the ability to look in the human brain for the first time over the past 10, 15 years with these brain imaging tools. So a lot of the work that we do in Oxford and other groups around the world and, uh, is to basically take normal healthy people, put them in our scanners and image the brain in action as they're detecting those pain stimuli. So we'll take people and we'll give them painful heat, we'll give them uh, pressure pain and then we'll see what bits of the brain activate in response to that pain inducing stimulus as opposed to something that's not painful, i.e. just a rub. And what we're finding is that there's a whole network of brain regions that get activated when the situation is painful versus when it's just a rub or something just normal sensory. And that's what we're basically trying to unravel at the moment. What about phantom pain? When someone, for instance, has a part of their body amputated for various reasons, and diabetes is a common example of someone who might lose a, a bit of a leg or something, but if you ask these people, they will say, I can still feel the missing part of my body, and by God, is it painful? That's right, and that's a very serious condition, uh, and people really do suffer terribly with phantom limb pain. Well, there's a couple of different theories describing what's going on there. The most simple one to explain is where you've lost the limb, you've obviously got raw nerves that have been cut, so those nerves are sending signals into the brain, signalling that a very traumatic event occurred. It was a very pain-inducing event, obviously, and they've just basically switched on permanently. What can happen after months and years is that the uh, brain areas that respond to these painful signals and tell you that this was painful, they basically get hardwired, if you like, and they get switched on permanently, and then that's really very devastating for the patient because in effect that pain is now being generated by the brain it is as real as if it's happening from from the outside uh, but now it's switched on permanently and this is why we need to understand what's going on in the brain because that's where we need then to target the therapies one person has suggested that in the same way as you get that phantom pain from the missing part of the body that tinnitus when you hear this funny rushing or singing mm -hmm. noise in the ears in the absence of any sound could be because there's a bit of your cochlea been damaged the thing that transduces or turns sound waves into nerve signals the missing cochlea is a bit like the missing bit of limb and so your tinnitus is phantom pain mm -hmm. but in an auditory sense. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. Something that is unpleasant. I mean, pain can be very, you know, you can broaden out the concept of pain to a very unpleasant, uh, a very unpleasant smell, a very unpleasant t a taste. You know, it, 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 this idea of pain being a sort of sensory phenomenon, uh, one can broaden it out to all the senses, vision, auditory, taste, uh, where it's just got to the level where it's a very unpleasant, discomforting uh, phenomenon. And this, this is something that, you know, tinnitus and certainly that screeching, people will use tricks and mechanisms of trying to distract themselves, not pay attention to it, maybe try to go to sleep listening to the radio, for instance, is often a, a mecha mechanism that's used in order to take their mind off the particularly unpleasant sensory phenomenon that's going on, whether it's pain, whether it's tinnitus. And given that you're able to pinpoint the regions of the brain that are becoming active in these f syndromes and phenomena, are we any closer to A, understanding exactly what's driving these things, and B, how to get rid of them? Yeah, we're, we're, we've done very well over the past 10 to 15 years in terms of now understanding that co complicated network of structures uh, that have to activate to give you a conscious perception of pain. And now what we're doing is trying to sort of target them selectively with drugs, with surgical therapies, uh, using things like cognitive behavioural therapies. Why is it that when you listen to a piece of music it can take your mind off the pain and make the pain less? Uh, why is it when you uh, get into that fight or flight situation of, of a sport event that you sustain quite a traumatic injury but you don't notice it at the time Rugby because you're so right. Smash their Egg collarbone to smithereens and play on. Exactly, that's exactly right. And then when the event's over and the high arousal situations calm down, they realise, oh my goodness, my leg's cut, this really hurts now. So we're starting to understand very well actually what the brain is doing in all those different scenarios so that where it's important for you not to perceive pain because you need to do something very immediately then, you can switch the pain signals off. And in other situations where you really need to be alert to the fact that this is painful, you can amplify them, if, if you will, uh, and make the pain experience much worse. And so that amplification and that attenuation process and what are the brain regions that are enabling both of them, we've started to understand now at quite a reasonably good level. And this bodes very well for um, both development of drugs and for development of target uh, areas for surgery and rehabilitation. Now, Irene, just earlier on, you mentioned music, and we've actually had an email from Jackson Cooper, who's a big fan, apparently he's been listening to the podcast for three months, and he says, we all know that music can affect mood. Some will calm you down, whereas other tunes will lift your mood. And also, it seems that certain personalities are often correlated to music genre, but always, uh, not always, of course. Um, so why does music change our mood, and do we know why? 
Well, again, that's an area that's been looked at with some, one of some of these imaging tools because they enable us to look at the human brain in action. And uh, certainly in the context of pain-relieving uh, mood where people will use um, music to help relieve, you know, a chronic pain syndrome, uh, a very, you know, calming, pleasant piece of music can not only enable one to be distracted from the pain, but it can also boost endogenous opioids. So our endorphins that we have or our enkephalins that we have in the body, again, certain types of music, very calming music, relaxing music, can be part of a strategy for sort of cognitive behavioural therapy to help people boost that endogenous system that we've got that, to get that added benefit. And that obviously will give you a bit of a high too. Uh, upbeat music, and, and we all know, can pep you up a little bit. So again, um, the actual brain regions which modulate the mood, we are less familiar with these days, but these are areas that have been looked at in the context of depression uh, and other types of mood disorders uh, and music is, is one of the areas that is being looked at, but we, we know less about it at the moment. I've got a question here very, very quickly. Uh, this is from Raphael Rona, uh, Reina, sorry, who's listening in California. It says, my name's Raphael Reina. I'm 14 years old. I live in California. I really enjoy your podcast. I have a question for you that's been bugging me and my sister for some time. Why is it that when you pinch the excess skin of your elbow, you don't feel the pain, even if you pinch really, really quite hard? OK, well, well, that's a classic example of mechanical pain, as I was saying earlier. Now, if, if you, uh, you... You're absolutely right, it doesn't feel as painful, but actually if you squeeze mechanically with pressure any part of your body, you'll realise that it's actually quite hard to make it painful unless you've got a bruise or some damage there already. So, in fact, as an experimental tool, it's one that we don't often use. Um, what um, Raphael might like to do is to take a pin and, uh, very carefully, try the pin on, again, that bit of the elbow compared to another part of the body. And what he'll probably see is that actually the, the perception of pain to that pinprick or to a heat, and do it very carefully, Raphael, with maybe a candle or something, is actually pretty similar. It's just specific to this mechanical crushing type of pain. It turns out that actually you have to go pretty extreme before you'd feel it painful anyway. Therefore, it feels as if you don't have any pain, pain receptors uh, at that bit of the skin, but that's actually not the case. Laying the facts bare, Ooh. the naked scientists. Dr Chris, Helen and Phil, we're here with you uh, for about the next 15 minutes and joining us now is Kathleen Taylor, also from Oxford University. Hi Kathleen, thanks for coming in. Thank you. The science of brainwashing. We've heard about the science of pain. Is it really possible to make someone do and think things that they don't want to? Absolutely. Tell us how. Well, there are various ways of doing it um, and I'm afraid for those who are looking for the Manchurian candidate type of process X where you press a magic button and it all goes funny and everybody starts doing your will, there is no such process X. However, what we do have is a set of psychological techniques that have been developed over many centuries but which reached, if you like, a kind of a head in the last half of the 20th century when they started being used on really quite large levels to persuade people, coerce, bully and sometimes even torture them into changing the way they thought about the world, changing the information that they used to deal with the world and changing the way they behaved. And what sorts of examples, I mean, giving general examples, I know you don't want to talk about specific groups that have been implicated, but they do exist, but what sort of general examples are we talking about here? Well, the word brainwashing was coined um, in the Korean War, and the reason it was coined was it was coined by an American journalist who was actually working for the CIA called Edward Hunter, and he wanted a term to describe what happened to American GIs who were kept in Chinese communist prisoner of war camps and who came out, a few of them, denouncing the American way of life, denouncing all imperialist poison, all the rest of it, and he couldn't understand why these boys who'd gone in, perfectly good Americans, had come out with this apparent complete reversal of their beliefs, and he wanted to call that something... He didn't have a name for it, so he called it brainwashing. Was it unshakable, that new belief they'd taken on? I mean, if, were they, was it just a question of persuading them that perhaps they got it wrong and they needed to rethink uh, what they'd been told over, over the last few years? Um, no. I mean, they were there quite often for quite a long time, but um, in some cases the beliefs lasted really quite a long time. I mean, the people became fervent communist converts. Um, other cases, they developed very severe mental illness, um, psycho psychosis, trauma. I mean, the effects were very, very devastating in a lot of cases. So if you chunk these people in Irene's brain scanner, would you be able to see structural changes in the brain, which would be a sign of someone having undergone this kind of therapy, if, for want of a better term? It's difficult to know because you wouldn't have a previous case to compare them with. You'd have to study them beforehand do the brainwashing and then study them afterwards. And, of course, you can't do that because it's totally unethical to, br to brainwash people. So we, we don't have an answer to that. We would suspect that you might see changes, but whether those would be at the level 
of um, you know of uh, such big brain regions that you'd actually be able to detect them on a scanner because I mean a scanner can tell you a certain amount but it can't tell you really fine detail that you might sort of expect with individual beliefs. But behaviourally, okay, you can see that people have changed their behaviour when they're brainwashed. What about if you zoom in on the brain in a brain scanner or something like that? Can you actually give some indication as to what bits of the brain are being affected and how they're being affected? Yes, what you might expect to see is that different areas of the brain, if you like, light up or are activated in response to different stimuli. So where, for example, an American GI, to take that example, might previously have responded very positively to, you know, the American flag. Now he might respond very negatively. So you might get the sort of threat response that you've previously associated with, like, communism. Is this now, just training, then? Is this just like having a mouse in a cage and doing something nasty to it until it stops doing what made it get a nasty shock or something? A certain amount of that is true, yeah, because these are all basic psychological processes. There's no, there's no magic in So why can't you just undo it, then? Because you're using an awful lot of stress and an awful lot of threat and an awful lot of coercion and sometimes torture as well. And that is very traumatising in itself, and to get over that takes a lot of therapy. So it looks like it could be pretty permanent, then? It's, it's pretty terrible thing to do to somebody, yes. Okay. If you'd like to know a bit more about this, Kathleen's written a fabulous book. It's actually called Brainwashing the Science of Thought Control. It's out at the moment, isn't it, from uh, OUP? Mm -hmm. Um, And we have a copy to give away this evening, so some lucky person... In fact, I've got two copies, and and she will sign both of them, which means even if you don't intend to keep it for the long term, you could auction it on eBay and it will treble in value instantly. (laughs) Uh, Let's have a quick chat to Paul. Hello, Paul. Hi. Paul's in Hertfordshire. Very quick question, Paul. What would you like to know? Yes. Why is it, if you see somebody... Get, say punch on the nose, and you, get, you go ouch if somebody else gets punched on the nose. Or oh, empathy. Oh, empathy, yeah. Now, uh, there's. Um, because it's very important for us to empathise with other people's pain and suffering. It's part of human nature. And in fact, a very nice experiment was done uh, by a Tanya Singer uh, just a couple of years ago using imaging. And what, um, if I've got time to describe it very briefly, basically they put women in the scanner and they looked at their brains as they were given a painful stimulus. And then they put the women's partners at the end of the scanner and they burnt their partners. But they imaged the women's brains as they watched their partners being burnt. And the interesting thing that they found in that study was that the areas of the brain that were active when the women looked at their partners were pretty much the same areas as those areas active in response to that person, that woman having pain in the first instance. So you basically activate a very similar set of structures, which means you really are having a painful experience yourself watching somebody else. And they were very cunning because they actually put women in because they felt that they would empathise better. Uh, So the control experiment obviously would be to put men in the scanner and get lights off. But they did do something similar with um, Schadenfreude, isn't it? The German thing, where uh, you actually get someone to trick you, and uh, and so you develop an intense dislike for that person. And when they put men in the scanner uh, and then showed them the person who tricked them being punished by electric shocks, they showed uh, they showed an absolutely horrendous amount of pleasure. These men, <laughs> whereas the women showed only empathy. So it, there's a there definite difference between That's men's right. and women's brains. But d- does that help you out, Paul? Yes, that's fine. Do you want to have a quick go at the quiz? Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, You could win yourself a copy of Kathleen's book, which I've read, actually. It's fantastic. Hot bubble baths were invented by Mr Jacuzzi. Do you think that's science fact or science fiction? Uh, Fiction. Sorry, that's absolutely true. They were actually invented by the Italian-American Jacuzzi. He invented the whirlpool bath to help ease his son's rheumatoid arthritis. Osteoporosis is a disease of cartilage, Paul. Is that fact or fiction? Oh, fiction. That's right, it's actually osteoporosis. Oh, sorry, I, I went... That to... was correct. Yeah, went sorry about that. Wrong noise. <laughs> osteoporosis literally means porous bones, and it's that term, bone-thinning disease, that affects more women than men. Thank you very much, Paul. OK, thank you. You're in the lead at the moment. Oh, cool. All right, thanks thank for joining you. us on The Naked Scientist. Bye. We're into about the last ten minutes of the programme, which means it's time to check back with our kitchen science posse. Derek's in the laboratory with Herbert and our volunteer this week, Chris. And Daniel reckons he knows the answer. Her, Daniel? Yeah. Yeah, what do you reckon's happening? The force of the salt pushes the the food colour into the side. Ah, so you did it. What colour did your water go? Green. Ah, well done. What, so do you use green food colouring to do it? Yeah. Excellent. Shall we see if you're right? Okay. Okay, you stay on the line and let's see if you're going away with this week's prize, okay? Okay. You hang on there and we'll go back to Derek. Derek, 
Hello again, welcome back to the Naked Scientist Laboratory and we are poised and ready to pour some of this salty dyed water into the big tub of uh, just normal water that we've got. Uh, so Herbert, would you care to instruct Chris, our helper, what to do? Right Chris, stand at uh, the end away uh, from the plug and then just pour it into uh, the side of the bath and quite quickly, there you go. Okay, and tell us what you see. Um, it's dispersing in the water and going towards the end. Okay, then, and if we look kind of down from the side and try and get an idea of where it is, you know, top or bottom, what, what do you see? It's at the bottom. And, I mean, this tub is totally transparent, of course, and if we look from the side, we can see that on the top, I mean, the water still looks rather transparent, doesn't it? Yeah, it's dark at the bottom and light, and then it's transparent. Okay, and so, yeah, we've basically got a nice layer of blue liquid, which is on the base, and even from the top, as if in the bathtub, we can kind of see this effect. So, yes, it didn't actually mix in, did it? So, I mean, why do you think that, that didn't mix in? I think it's because the food colouring is more dense. OK, then, yeah, well, it is salty water. So, Herbert, then, what we all really want to know is why has this happened? Well, Chris made uh, the water heavier by adding the salt. The food colouring hardly changed the density at all. It is the salt that makes it heavy. And then, as he poured it in, the relatively more dense salty water sunk to the bottom and displaced the relatively light, clear water. And then it ran along the bottom, really driven by gravity. Gravity is making it run horizontally along the bottom of the container or the uh, bath and leaves the dyed salty water at the bottom. The heaviest bit of the fluid is at the bottom. So the, the thing is that we did pour it in there quite quickly and yet it, it's remained at the bottom. It hasn't, you know, mixed in. I mean, it's not just become one big, slightly blue mixture. So why is that? Well, it doesn't uh, mix because the uh, salty water is heavier and separate. In fact, if we waited here, Derek, I think we might have to wait maybe about 10, 20 years before it would really mix in effectively. And that's a long time for the show. It is indeed. I mean, hell, we've, we've got a live radio to run. We can't wait that long. I mean, the thing is, um, it's all water, isn't it? I mean, it's water with salt in it or water without. So it really does strike me as very strange that they don't mix together of their own volition. Well, if I took a uh, relatively heavy tennis ball and I released it in the air and it stayed there, you'd get a bit of a shock. What you'd expect it to happen is because it's heavier than the air, it drops to uh, the bottom. The same is true here, that you have relatively heavy, salty water that goes to the bottom. It can be mixed, but you have to give the energy that's needed in order to lift the heavy fluid up and mix it in. And, of course, um, you at home can actually try that if you like because you'll notice that it won't really mix in. But there are ways to kind of add that energy and mix it in, you know. Just quickly, what are the especially good ways to try and mix that stuff in, Herbert? Well, there are two different experiments that you might like to uh, do here. One is to take a ruler or your hand and just swirl the ruler around, keeping it vertical. Then what you're doing is you're giving horizontal motion and there will be rather little mixing. Or what you could do is take uh, a spoon and actually move the fluid vertically to lift the heavy fluid up, and then it'll mix very much better. Now then, of course, we do see this effect um, around the world, don't we? I mean, kind of in nature, as it were. So where, where do we see this, Herbert? Well, it happens in lots of different situations. But let me just tell you, in the Antarctic, when ice forms... It leaves behind the salt, and so you get salty water, just as uh, Chris has uh, made. And it's sunk to the bottom, and then this happens at the South Pole. Where can it go? It's got to go northwards. That's the only direction. And in fact, we now know that that current, which is called the Antarctic bottom water current, goes probably as far as 50 degrees north. So it travels a very long way indeed, driven by that excess of salinity. Excellent. Thank you very much, Herbert. And Chris, thank you very much for helping us with this one. Uh, what did you think of it? Uh, very interesting. And uh, are you going to be going home and doing all this in your bath now and preventing everyone in your family having a wash? Definitely. Good stuff. Excellent. We have a convert once again. That's great. OK, well, uh, it's all here from the Naked Scientist Laboratory and uh, we'll be back next time with some more kitchen science for you to do. Until then, goodbye.
Thank you very much, Derek, uh, out there in the laboratory with Herbert Huppert and our volunteer, Chris. Next week, Derek will be going off in search of the reason why the sky is blue, and this is an experiment that you can try at home too. Right, Daniel, well yeah. done, my friend. You got it right. Thanks. Brilliant effort. So you have won yourself this week's prize. I've got a fabulous book all about living science for you, how science works in everyday life. What? Thank you for taking part on The Naked Scientist. Yeah. Take care now. Bye. Bye. Right, a couple of quick questions. Helen, what have you got there for Kathleen? Um, we have a question here um, from Six Mile Bottom from Catherine who wants to know, is there any way we can minimise brainwashing? Yes, there is. There are very many ways to do it, but basically they all boil down to learning more about it, educating yourself, learning what's going on, looking at the way people are manipulating you, practising by looking, for example, at adverts on the telly, learning what the tricks are, what the, um, the techniques are that people use to manipulate your mind, and then once you've learned those, you can start to notice them and pick them out and resist them. And it's actually, it's in Kathleen's book, uh, Brainwashing the Science of Thought Control. And uh, we've got two copies here. So if you give us a ring, perhaps we'll get you one of them. 08459 25 2000. Right, I've got a quick email here from Flavio Kaplan. Uh, I think this one's probably for you, Irene. Uh, he goes, uh, hi, Chris. Um, in your Christmas special, you talked about why you can't tickle yourself. The brain inhibits the tickle by shutting it off while you perform the, the conscious tickle. Um, why can't you tickle yourself? Um, more to the point. And also, why doesn't this work with pain? If I stick a needle in my finger after telling telling myself it's not going to hurt, it still hurts. OK, well, actually, you can tickle yourself, and uh, Sarah Jane Blakemore did some nice experiments showing how you do this. What you need to get is a tickle stick, which, when you move it, a has, has a delay. Uh, <laughs> and so from your movement, there's, say, a pause between actually when the thing does the tickle on you, and you find that will actually make you laugh. And uh, she's done some elegant experiments unravelling the neuroscience behind that with imaging. Which, Why, in 30 seconds, is? is oh, well, that, so, so in terms of the pain bit, uh, you actually can. If you, if you do prepare and block yourself, you can um, boost those endogenous uh, opioids, just like in that fight or flight response or the placebo effect and uh, when you know the pain's coming and you're prepared for it and you psych yourself up for it, you can actually just take the edge off it and uh, modulate that pain a little bit so it's not so painful. Uh, and so this whole idea of saying um, when you're on the battlefield and getting smashed by bullets and things you don't notice because of the heat of the moment, that's that the same mechanism? Yeah, very similar. Yeah, exactly. OK, well, I have to say a huge thank you both to Kathleen Taylor and Irene Tracy, both from Oxford University. They talked about the science of brainwashing and also the science of pain and a little bit about how the brain works. Next week, um, we, we mentioned this last week, we're actually going off in search of how the weather's forecast. We're going to be joined by Alex Hill, who's the head of the Met Office here in the UK, by Tim Palmer, who knows all about forecasting and predicting weather forecasts, and Emily Shuckborough from Cambridge University. So if you have any questions on the weather, send them to me now, chris at nakedscientist.com. A massive thank you to Helen and Phil and our production team here Thank you to Petro, to Anna and to Holly Barclay. We've had a wonderful evening this evening. Thank you very much for all of your input. Our winner this evening is Paul, who's going to go away with a copy of Kathleen's book. Have a great evening. Sorting out the sparks from the quarks. The Naked Scientists. For more information, get online at nakedscientists.com.